Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Astoria Bookshop launch event for Chef's Kiss by TJ Alexander. We are so excited to share this book with you and hear from both TJ and our guest, Anita Kelly. I'm Laura. I'm the events coordinator here at Astoria Bookshop. Um, if you don't know who we are, we are a general interest bookshop located in Western Queens, and uh, we are wonderful, and you should buy a million books from us. You didn't hear that from me. Um, before we get started, I want to go through a few housekeeping things. Um, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions during the last 10 or 15 minutes. You can do so at the bottom where it says ask a question, and you can also vote on other people's questions. Um, other than that, just a quick, <laughs> yes, Carter, a story bookshop is wonderful. Um, just a quick uh, rundown of our event policies. Just keep it respectful in the chat over there. We like messages about congratulations. We do not like anything racist or homophobic or anything offensive of the sort. My rule of thumb is don't write anything you wouldn't want your mom or boss to see. Um, that being said, uh, <laughs> to reiterate, uh, because TJ <laughs> asked, you can curse. You can get a little wild. You can get a little randy um, <laughs> as a treat. <laughs> Um, other than that, you can order a signed copy through us. I did not put the button on the screen. I will do that right now. My bad. Um, but there will be a green button momentarily where you can order the copy, or you can just go to storyabookshop.com. And with that, I'm going to introduce our guests and get right to it. And we can learn how to make a cheesecake, because I sure as hell don't know. All right. TJ Alexander is an amateur baker and author who writes about queer love. Originally from Florida, me too. Um, they received their MA in writing and publishing from Emerson College in Boston. They live in New York City with their wife and various houseplants, and they are represented by Larissa Mello Pienkowski, I'm hoping I'm saying that right, of Jill Grinberg Literary Management. Originally from a small town in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, Anita Kelly now lives in the Pacific North Northwest with their family. A teen librarian by day, they write romance that celebrates queer love and all its infinite possibilities. Whenever not reading or writing, they're drinking too much tea, taking pictures, and dreaming of their next walk in the woods. They hope you get to pet a dog today. I did pet my dog today. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, and with that, I will leave you both to it. Have fun. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Okay, first of all, I, I feel like my Hi, I feel like since you're like a little bit further away behind your setup there, yes. my face is like so much larger than yours. It's fine. So I think I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my large face. Um, but first, I know you have a whole demonstration set up, but I just want to ask you first before you get going, how you are doing and how you're feeling on your release day. I mean, personally, I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> Um, internationally, everything's pretty disastrous, but like putting that aside. Right. Yeah. Yes. We're uh, just no. like a little, we're in a little cone of like chef's kiss happiness right now. And Good point. Yes. I love to, that. We're going to allow ourselves to. To celebrate. Because you, because you deserve that. So. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my therapist agrees. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, this book has been, you know, many years in the works, and I'm just so excited that it's out there today and that actual people who are not my mom will read it. Although, you know, I love that my mom is reading it. Hi, mom. She's in the chat, I'm sure, <laughs> if she can figure it out. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I'm just stoked that the excellent, brilliant champions at my publisher, Atria, have just, you know, work their butts off for this. And, you know, today we get to kind of celebrate the book and celebrate them. And yeah, I'm, I'm feeling really good about it. And I'm really glad to, you know, hi, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just like having the best time, honestly. Um, I really am. That's awesome. Do you want to see um, me make a cheesecake? <laughs> I do. I'm like, okay, I'm so by this. 
Yeah. I heard that TJ was going to like cook on camera. I'm like, wow, that is way more than I was able to do on my release day. So I'm no, really I mean, let's be honest, it's probably more doing. than I'm able to do. We haven't gone through it yet. So let's not like <laughs> let's not uh, no, promise no too much here. Yeah, this this was an idea that um, me and a story bookshop cooked up. Um, we thought it would be fun, and let's I guess let's just see how good I can multitask. I guess uh, this is a cheesecake that comes from the book, and it's based off of the first thing I ever learned how to bake, which is my mom's cheesecake. Uh, kind of zhuzhed up a little bit and made a little bit fruity, like me. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, I guess I'm just gonna do the whole Ina Garden thing if everyone's cool with that. Um, yeah, this is one stick of butter melted that's been sitting here for a while, but let's not worry about it. And this is like most of a box of vanilla wafer cookies, not name brand, they don't pay me to talk about them, um, <laughs> crushed up with two tablespoons of sugar, just for, just for fun because um, they don't have enough sugar in them, I guess. And um, this is gonna be the crust because in the book, Simone, who is a actual chef who knows what she's doing, um, makes a short crust pastry and I'm not gonna do that. Sorry, I mean, no one needs to do that. If Nilla Wafers and the good people at Nabisco have done all this for you basically, then I don't see why you would do anything else with your time. So. Anyway, that's it. You can just mix that together and press it into a nine inch springform can. If I can interject real quick, I have never, because you know, you always hear about cheesecake often going with graham cracker crust. I've never known the Nilla wafer, like hot tip. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, you could do a graham cracker crust. I just think with all the tropical fruity stuff that's going on in there that like the cinnamon is a little bit of a weird note. Um, yeah. Yeah. In the original version of this cheesecake, it's actually made with Zweibot crackers, which is something that nobody eats anymore outside of like the Rust Belt. So, <laughs> so I decided not to, um, not to, I'm going to just do it with my hands, which are very clean. Nobody freak out. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Nella wafers, basically any digestive biscuit, if you're a British person that eats digestive biscuits, Anything like that, you can just pound up and make into a crust, and then you don't have to make pastry, which who has time to make pastry? Not me. Right. <laughs> All right, so that's done. And then it goes into the oven for 10 minutes at 350. And then and then more things happen, which you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I should plan this out better, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so yeah, anyway, that's that, into the oven. All right, and now I should set a timer because if we if we leave that, that would be disastrous yet charming. Um, <laughs> so yeah, what can we talk about while that's doing its thing, Anita? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, someone just said that it's hard to hear me. Sorry, I will try to shout a bit louder. Um, but yeah, so actually, as that's cooking, um, so I was really struck when I read your book. Um, about how much you clearly do know about cooking. Um, because I also have a book out about cooking, but I don't know anything about cooking. And it was very obvious when I read yours that yours is different. So I was just like um, interested in a little bit of your culinary background and like how you came to write a romance that's based around the food world. Sure. Well, first of all, if you all haven't read Anita's amazing, amazing book, Love and Other Disasters, it's great. It's beautiful. I. Honestly, I'm not just saying this to be funny. I laughed and I cried and it's just a great book um, about food and yeah, please, please read it. Um, and I wouldn't know from reading that that you don't know anything about food because it all sounded very, very good. Uh, but yeah, my my culinary background is, um, uh, I mean, I grew up in restaurants. My parents ran restaurants. And so I, I did kind of every job in a restaurant, but cooking while I was growing up and I never cooked until I was a much older person. And then I kind of was taught how to cook via like Food Network and like all the greats and Alton Brown and Ina and just like, those were my heroes, like 
you know, in my little college kitchen trying to figure out how to make pasta. Like, <laughs> um, that's that's how I learned how to cook was from TV. And so, yeah, um, when I got older and baking became um, this hobby that kind of like helped me relax, uh, I just, I got really into that because it made me slow down. It made me, instead of just kind of like do things on the fly, which I think cooking is, is more of a, you know, just try things and see what happens. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Baking is a lot more strict. You got to pay attention to things. And maybe the people who have joined us tonight have noticed <laughs> I need to um, work on that skill sometimes. So baking helps me, no, you know, not just I... calm down. It helps me like keep on track and uh, keep focused. So yeah, my I'm a complete amateur when it comes to cooking and baking. Everything I do is just like home recipes and stuff that's really easy because I'm not a professional at all. Um, Dana, that's a lie. She's in the chat telling people <laughs> lies. <laughs> telling people I'm really good at it. I mean, I do love it. I do love cooking and feeding people. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, most of the recipes in the book were just kind of dreamed up as like, if I did have skills and knew what I was doing, what kind of food would I try to make? So yeah, that's where things like this, this cheesecake came from. I, I'm trusting the people in the chat that you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Dana's mom is in the chat. All the moms are now in the chat yelling at me. This is amazing. I'm sorry, oh, moms. God. I didn't mean to call anyone a liar. I'm so chagrined. <laughs> uh, yep. I think we lost here Anita. Okay, here I am. Is Anita back? Yes. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Yes, hi. Oh, God, it was just me for a minute. Man, was that scary. <laughs> Yeah, no, I will say, um, too, uh, so, and I'm sure you probably had this same experience, TJ, when we found out about each other's books, I was like, oh, someone wrote the same book as me, because we, both of our books are about cooking, and they both have um, a woman and non-binary character uh, pairing, but then when I, so I had this like little panic, you know, moment like, oh, okay, someone else wrote my book. But then I think we both, you know, have talked about when I actually read your book, um, I loved reading about um, like how different and how similar our books were. And I feel like it really reinforces the idea that you can never have too many, like, you know, queer stories or oh, absolutely. too many non-binary stories and um like all the parts we had that were similar were just like really comforting to me and yes. then the parts we had that were so divergent were just really like fascinating um so i'm just like so glad that both of our books exist out there and that there are now like multiple like books you know that you can buy at barnes and noble that have a non-binary love interest and it's just um it's just yeah really no, totally. Because I think, you know, I, I went through the exact same thing of like, as soon as <laughs> I think the day that my deal announcement um, was up on Twitter, the very first like tweet I got from some random person who wasn't my mom, like saying, oh, I'm so proud, was some person who was like, oh, another like non-binary foodie romance. And I was like, wait, there's another one. And like, I didn't care for the tone, but I was also very no. excited because like, obviously I want to read a non-binary foodie romance because like, that's what I wrote. That's obviously what I want to like check out. So yeah. yeah, I mean, I was, I, I, you know, I was nervous that people would assume, oh, they're the same book, you know, you know, it's just the same thing. And it's like, it's, it's so obviously not like, I think most yeah. readers are sophisticated enough to realize that like no two people are going to have the same experiences and tell the same exact story in the exact same way. Like, it's just, it's not possible, right. you know? So like, yeah, when I read your book, I was just like, at first very nervous. Cause I was like, Oh, I kind of had something similar in my book, but it's like, yeah, I had two people falling in love in my book too. Like, obviously there's going to be some similarities. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the yeah. differences were just fascinating to me. And I was like, wow, like it really does go to show like you could, and should perhaps publish a thousand different non-binary romances because you're gonna get a thousand different stories that like, you know, yeah. are probably very good. <laughs> yeah, Yeah. exactly. And yeah, and I, 
I like I don't know how much I can say in terms of like spoiler alerts for your book like I feel like a lot of the stuff I want to talk about happens later in the book so I don't want to spoil everything but yeah but there were scenes in your book that were like you know totally different from anything I had in mind that were scenes that like I didn't know how badly I wanted to read them until I read them in your book and so I feel like you know I feel like it's just so like wonderful yeah and I agree um there's a comment in the chat about um how many books you can find these days with envy characters and that's true I think if anything though like adult romance is a bit behind um in that aspect like you can find a lot of yeah teen and sometimes even like middle grade and children's and toddlers books with gender diversity but um but yeah we would still have so many more stories to, to tell no to totally teach when I was first oh. getting ready to write this book or as I was writing this book I was trying to find you know similar books or books that had like, you know, similarities that I could, you know, comp to when I was trying to get an agent. And I, I ended up reading a bunch of YA books because that was where all the yeah. really cool representation and gender gender diversity was happening, which is great. But, you know, yeah. I kept thinking like, you know, what, we grow up, <laughs> like we don't stay 15 forever. Eventually like your trans and non-binary teens become like trans and non-binary adults and like, I just I, I think there is definitely a place for those stories because like yeah we haven't we haven't gotten a chance to tell them for so long. Yeah. And you were just talking about yeah, like the process of when you were, you know, pitching this book and trying to get this book sold. So Chef's Kiss is your debut novel. So can you talk a little bit about like your road to publication and like what the best part of it has been, what led you to write romance, all that good stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I worked in publishing for like a hot minute, <laughs> like back in the day, like in the, in another era, I think is fair to say. And um, I got into like the business side of, of publishing, um, like social media, like just as was just taking off and, and, and things like that. Um, I got into that side of the business um, because I was under this impression that you know to be to to get into the writing part of it was just going to be too difficult and that the stories that i wanted to tell like no one was ever going to buy them um which at the time was probably true so i'm not going to beat myself up too much about it <laughs> uh, but yeah i i studied english in college and and then later went on um to to work in publishing uh we both went to emerson i think so yeah, I did my grad, my grad school program was um, the publishing program at Emerson. And um, I, so I went uh, into the industry on like that side of things. And I just, I wasn't, I wasn't very good at it. I'll just admit, I had a very, you know, for people who read the advanced, you know, readers copies or have read their copy already, you know, I don't think it's a huge spoiler. It's on, it's on the, it's on the back copy, but Simone ends up having to do a lot of social media stuff that she's just not comfortable with or doesn't want to do. And I think a lot of, of that comes from my current attitude of just like being really, really wary of, you know, that stuff and knowing how easily it can like take over your life and, and, you know, make you into this person who's just obsessed with stats and, um, oh, sorry, that's my timer. That's, this is so rude of me. I should plan this out. No, better. you're fine. No, you get, you get your crust. Yeah, no, I'm going to turn my back to the audience, which is always you're great fine. to do. No, I'll just interject. Um, yeah, quickly, and then you can continue your tale. But it's just so funny as you're talking, like, how many things we have in common, TJ. Yes, because as you said, I also went to the writing and publishing program at Emerson College, which was great. And it is mainly geared towards, like, yeah, putting people into the publishing industry. And yeah. I think I went to, like, three interviews, like, in, you know, the publishing world. And I was like, mm, this isn't for me. <laughs> like, I am not going to be good at this, which I kind of knew going in. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I'd also kind of like lost my faith in my ability to write a book, like while I was in the program. And so it's just like, mm, maybe this isn't for me until, yeah. you know, ten, every ten writing later class that I was in or every like writing workshop that I ever took, it was like, I was writing these stories about people kissing and everyone else was like very literary, very highbrow. Now that there's, you know. Yes. We love a literary novel once in a while, but like, sure. you know, I would show up with my stuff and everyone would just kind of be like, oh, hmm, hmm. okay. Yeah. You know, it just wasn't the right audience, I think, for what I was trying to do. 
So um, yeah, so I, I was like, well, I guess I guess people don't want to read this stuff. Um, and and you know, it, it, and I I wouldn't um, think anything bad of people who said this, but you know, a lot of my professors were very blunt in telling me like, you know, this is kind of a really hard thing to do to make a living out of. Like it's kind of impossible, and you probably shouldn't do it. <laughs> like I got told a lot, like you probably just shouldn't do it. So after you hear that like a few dozen times, you kind of go like, yeah, I probably shouldn't do this, huh? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, but then but then I um, started writing this book when the pandemic hit, and I just thought like, you know, mm -hmm. I have all this free time on my hands, and I may as well like, you know, as a as a laugh, try and take my mind off mm -hmm. things by by working on this on this book. So, and as I was doing it, I was like, actually, this isn't not bad. This is pretty good. Um, yeah. I think people might read this, but like, I thought like people like my mom and, <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, I, I was very lucky to be surrounded with good folks who were encouraging and, you know, told mm -hmm. me that it was worthwhile to, you know, uh, try and stick it out. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Found an agent. That's amazing. You, you started writing this book during the pandemic? Yes. Like as soon as the That's pandemic awesome. hit, I had had the idea for this book early in 2020. I had gone to the Met Museum. They were doing a miniature exhibit of like little, like you wind them up and the miniatures, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that my friend and I were like, this is the year we're gonna sit down and write a book. I know we've said this for like years. Every year we say, this is the year we should really write down write down a book. We should really just sit down and do it. And, and we said that we were going to do it for real this time. And then we went home and I did not write my book. <laughs> At all um, until the panini hit, and I was like, "Oh, I guess, I guess I have no excuse right now because I'm not doing anything. I'm just stuck at home." So yeah, um, this was definitely a pandemic, right? Uh, it took me um, an un it was an unhealthy amount of time that I spent writing the first draft. It was like five or six weeks, uh, and then and then there and then there she was. <laughs> There was a book. Wait, wait, sorry. Sorry, did yeah. you say that you wrote the first draft in five or six weeks? I know. Oh, I know. It's not that's, good that's for a person's fast. psyche. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just, I, fast. yeah, it was very fast. And I don't think I'm a fast writer normally, to be honest. But for whatever reason, this, this went very fast. Probably because, you know, I had kind of the outline shaken around in my head a little bit. So that was good. I, I kind of had a, um, a head start on that. And I had no distractions. I had like a dearth of distractions. I had negative distractions. Um, and, and so that kind of forced me to actually finish it uh, in, instead of all these other projects that maybe in the past I would have, you know, started and then stopped and, you know, gotten mm -hmm. sick of and put down. So, so yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of how the process went. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> Um, cause it, it was, it was not a, a good way to write a book, but it was the way I did it. So. I love that though. The inspiration was there. You went for it. Like that's, that's amazing because yeah. like for, um, people who aren't familiar with the publishing process, like to write a book that fast and then get it published within a couple of years, like that's incredible. So I just think that's really cool. I, I was really lucky. Like the process went pretty fast. Um, you know, from querying to, to signing and, and all that, it, everything, you know, even though it, in the moment, you know, it seems like, gosh, it's been a week and I haven't gotten any answers, you know, in, in the moment oh, yeah. you think like everything's taking forever. But publishing is yeah. like, if you don't know, is this industry that takes years and years and years for literally any decision to get made. So, um, so yeah, I was very lucky that things moved really quickly after that. Real quick, I feel like you should update us on what's happening next with your cheesecake. Good point. Like so the crust, the crust is cooling. Okay. Crust is cooling. Oven has been lowered to 325, which is important. And um, then I guess I can I make the filling? It, it takes a few seconds. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so in a blender, you are going to mix up the following. You're going to mix up a cup of heavy cream. Love heavy cream. <laughs> I wish I had like filler to tell you in between these things. Um, this is a this is one and a half pounds of cottage cheese, any kind, any because it's all going to get blended up. It doesn't matter. Uh, so that's like one and a half um, containers, really. 
then just please don't judge it right now. It's an Eastern European thing um, of which I'm a proud member of that people. Uh, it, I know a lot of people hate cottage cheese, but like you don't understand. Something magical is going to happen, and it's not gonna. It's not gonna be cottage <laughs> cheese anymore. So shut up. Um, I, didn't, I didn't need to get so aggressive with you. <laughs> didn't Simone in the book? Hadn't she like never had cottage cheese or something? Or am I making that up? I think or she learned like how to make this cheesecake from her boss. Okay. Was <laughs> was where the base of this recipe came from. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cracking myself up. I'm so sorry. This is a cup of sugar. Um, we're just doing it. That's it. Um, then you need two tablespoons of citrus. I'm going to use orange juice, but you can use lemon juice. I mean, those are the only two citrus that I can think of right now. <laughs> but you know, you know what citrus are. You know, I don't. You don't need me to tell you. Okay. And um, and then a quarter of a cup of flour. I don't know why. I don't know what this does. I assume it like binds everything together. I'm yeah. Yeah, I'm not Alton Brown. Okay, so I can't. I couldn't tell you. Um, and then four eggs, which I pre-cracked because I was so nervous about missing. <laughs> gonna do it in front of Fair people. enough. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you for understanding. <laughs> um, and then you're gonna need a teaspoon of vanilla. I guess you could use almond ash extract if you're like a terrible person, but <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna use vanilla and I'm just gonna, listen, the world's ending. It doesn't matter how much you use. Um, <laughs> okay, so then you also have an orange. That's gonna be for later. And now you just blend this up, which this is not my blender. So let's see how this goes. <laughs> I just realized I do not know how it works, but I'm an adult and I have been in kitchens before. So how hard could this be? So this is going to be great as a sound that other people are going to have to listen to. And I'm so sorry about it, but it won't take long. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was much more powerful than my blender at home. I am, I promise you, I'm not doing this for gags or for jokes or for laughs. This is all real. <laughs> and I, I wanted it to explode. Just yeah. Fun. Oh, that would have been just great. To watch you survive that. Yeah. How does it open? I have no idea. Lauren, just, just, do I just, I, I can tell it's not going to work. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, yes, it did. Okay, we did it. <laughs> I feel so happy. All right, so just um, <laughs> give it a stir. Make sure you've got all the bits because sometimes bits get stuck, especially the, um, the flour. Sometimes pockets of that get stuck. But it looks like we did it. We did it, gang. Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so you take your orange and I I do this because I thought it was very chefy. I didn't want to blend up the orange zest because then you don't see the bits, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if this is the right or wrong thing to do, but it's what I'm doing. So like, you know, two or three teaspoons of orange zest, um, just right in. And then, and then that's just- thing is always fancy. Yeah, that's a, so a little fancy thing that makes people go, ooh, what's yeah. that in the background? You're like, that's the zest, bitch. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to the Astoria Bookshop for telling me that I could curse. It was the wrong decision uh, for you to, to do, but that's okay. Okay, so that's your orange and that's your zest and that's your filling and then you're almost done. Um, you just take this, give it a stir so that the zest isn't all, you know, one giant chunk. And then we're gonna fill our case if it's cool enough. I think it's cool enough. And then hopefully this doesn't leak. And if it does, you didn't see it. <laughs> you didn't see that. So into, into the crust it goes. Oh, that's actually really nice. I'm sorry, I'm like getting full of myself now because I think I did a really good job. <laughs> And then we can, we can we can all tell that you did. We can tell thank you. That. that looks good. Yeah. 
So then you're going to take this, which you made before. Um, <laughs> this is roasted pineapple jam, which is just okay. two and a half cups of pineapple, half a cup of um, sugar, a couple of tablespoons of orange juice or you know pineapple juice or whatever you have on hand on the stove. And then just cook it down for like 40 minutes to an hour. Um, if you have a recipe card from the Astoria Bookshop, it'll tell you like, 20 minutes to 40 minutes, but like, I I honestly took it a little longer. I think it could it could take it longer. And then you just dollop that in there um, and let it sink in. And then that's it, it goes in the oven. This is important, it goes in the oven <laughs> very slowly. <laughs> uh, Anita, thank you so much for like letting me be a goofball like on this, oh my gosh, on this I love it. very serious book event with you. Um, it goes in the oven for an hour. We should set a timer, even though we're going to be done talking by then. Um, yeah. So it goes in the oven for an hour, and then you don't touch it. You don't open the oven. You turn the oven off, and you let it sit in there for one more hour so that it slowly oh. cools down and unbakes. It bakes slow. I would not be able to do that. <laughs> because you always open the oven door, right? Yeah. I did too. The first like 40 times I made this cheesecake, I was just like, <laughs> is it done? Like, no, it's not. You've just got to trust. You just got to trust. You literally cannot mess it up if you just don't open the oven. Okay. This sounds so good. That pineapple jam, like, oh my Yeah, God. honestly, you could just eat the pineapple jam on its own. <laughs> yeah. It gets all caramely and, you know, it's delicious. I love it. Um, but yeah, the flavors of this were inspired by another family recipe called um, Yankee salad, which is one of those like weird Midwestern salads with Cool Whip and, you know, some mar some people put marshmallows in. I don't judge. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love that stuff. I'm sorry. I'm not going to make apologies. <laughs> so yeah, no. it's, it's, it's the same. It's the same flavor. It's just putting a cheesecake. That was one of my favorite um, parts of the book, uh, Ray and Simone making like those, like, uh, yeah, like Midwestern, like classic dishes together and like making them better. I think my favorite part, well, there were lots of favorite parts of your book. Tell me all about them. <laughs> <laughs> but, like all the, all the ideas they had for the show were like, I would watch that. Like I wanted to watch their show. Like every idea you had was just so like organic and great. Um, no, same. Like laugh. As, as I was like coming, I was like, oh, they ha they're going to have to like come up with a show concept. Like what kind of show could they do? And when I came up with the idea for like, oh, a show where you like take family recipes and make them like edible. Um, I was like, well, that's, I've watched that. I've watched that in a minute. I'm like, you know, yeah. doing my writerly typing thing. Like this is a great idea that someone should buy yeah. from me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And like, and I wanted to watch Ray's episodes of just like rambling about making beer. Like that sounded fantastic. I like, I just wanted to like experience everything that was in this book in my yeah. life. <laughs> I am, I am <laughs> hugely addicted to YouTube channels with just like random concepts. Mm -hmm. Like I just, I love it. I love watching either like a soothing channel, like an ASMR thing or like just random yeah. stuff. Just somebody like excited about a thing and talking about it. Like, I don't know. I just, I really like that stuff. So yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you like their little fake shows. Well, good. And actually I wanted to dig in a little bit to um, both of your characters. Uh, yeah. Cause I did love this book so much because I mean, I love character driven stories and most of the time romance is character driven, but I thought both of these characters were just so like strong and unique and I just love them. Um, and so the book is told from Simone's point of view. Um, and Simone is just such a great character. I, I was just really into her. And so I'm curious, like how you developed her and like why you decided to tell the story solely from her point of view and basically how she came to be. Yeah. Um, I think when I was kind of like thinking of Ray and Simone as like, you know, fully constructed people, like I started with a very basic idea that like one of them's going to be grumpy and one of them's going to be like a giant Labrador retriever, sunshiny puppy type. Cause I, I really like when a couple in a romance has that dichotomy. I think it's very funny. Um, you know, there's like a lot of natural humor that comes from somebody who's just like there to have fun and make friends and someone who is not there to have fun or make friends. 
friends. <laughs> like, you know, a lot of the mm -hmm. jokes come from just like how funny it is to see them interacting when they're so different. Um, but I also like was thinking of in, in terms of like almost splitting my own personality down in half. Like, I think a lot of people, especially who meet me for the first time, would think that I'm, you know, very outgoing and loud and friendly. And, and I am. And like, that's a lot of where Ray's personality is coming from. But I think that, you know, inside a lot of the time, I feel a lot like Simone. I'm very anxious. I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. You know, I'm always worried about how I look to other people, you know, all that stuff that you talk about in therapy. <laughs> So yeah. writing these two characters, kind of learning how to get along and then like actually like, you know, getting to the point where they're like really strong friends and their relationship is really strong. And then to the point where they're like defending each other and loving each other like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a little cheesy, but it was a little bit of like, you know, me being able to tell the two halves of my personality, like, you know, you're not fighting all the time or you don't have to fight all the time. Like, you know, you actually... Yeah are, you know, you can complement each other. Like you can work together really well. Mm -hmm. So that was, I love that. yeah, thank you all. And you, and you wrote them like their interaction so well, like I would definitely call this book like a slow burn. Um, Cause they really do get to know each other. Like you said, which I am personally very bad at doing. I want them to kiss after like chapter two. Well, so, I'll so, just, <laughs> I'll just say your book, which is very, very steamy. And, and I, I mean, I love that. I loved that. Like, it was kind of like a, almost at first sight, like, where's the nearest horizontal surface kind of thing. Like, that was very cool and hot. Um, and, you know, A plus, gold star. Uh, I think the they're, slow they're burn- great ways of telling stories, though. Yeah, the, yes. Yeah. As we were saying before, like, there's a million ways to tell, uh, a, you know, all these different love stories. And for this story, um, I knew that because they weren't going to get along at first, like really not going to get along at first, that it was going to take a while for them to develop enough of a connection for the reader to believe that they would even like, you know, be in the same room together and have a good time. Um, yeah. And I felt like if they, if they wanted to go along on that ride with them and see how that mm -hmm. happened, um, then it could be really cute and, and, and fun. So um, yeah. I, I know the slow burn isn't but, everyone's thing, but yeah, it worked out for this. Yeah. Well, because I, I feel like what I liked too about their relationship is that even though they were like oil, oil and water, like they were never like disrespectful of each other or like mean to each other. And so like they still had this like respectful relationship that then they could just like build on. And so it wasn't like, because sometimes in enemies to lovers, I feel like they're just like, bad to each other and i'm yeah. like this isn't romantic like this isn't romantic to me um, yeah but, like i could like but i like rooted for you know rain simone from you know the beginning and i feel like you just wrote like their interaction so cleverly like i think one of my favorite parts was towards the beginning when simone types this very like professional email to ray and is like we are going to be professional at work or, or whatever she says. And, and like then the then punctuation like, is perfect and everything is like, kind yeah. regards. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then I think Ray responds with just Roger that. And yeah. I'm just like, like okay. <laughs> <laughs> like whatever phrasing you use, like made me laugh out loud. Cause it was like, so Ray and like, anyway. Yeah. Um, it, and, and that's, you know, I love, I love when the humor comes from like, you know, we're seeing the story from Simone's point of view. So we're seeing like how anxious she is and like, she's retyping this email a thousand times and then she's sending it and like waiting for a response with her, like, you know, hands on her hips. And then right. when she gets the response and it's just like, all right, she's just like, mm. like <laughs> to me, that's very yeah. funny. So like one of the reasons that I'm telling the story from her point of view is because I, I think it's very funny to, um, you know, have that character be like kind of stumbling through and like, we know she's trying really hard and like, you know, we're, we hopefully feel sympathetic towards her, but you know, it's just, it's, it's very funny to see a person who is very stringent and strict with themselves be put in these, you know, uh, duck out of water situations. Um, mm -hmm. And another reason that I wanted to tell the story from her point of view was because, you know, I, I, it's not a spoiler because it's on the back of the book. Um, you know, in the course of this book, Ray comes out at work um, as non-binary. They, they've been out, you know, in every other aspect of their lives um, except for work and 
decides to first come out to Simone. Um, and I, I wanted there to be, I wanted the story to kind of show the arc of their relationship in a way that kind of celebrated in a lot of ways, um, the, the love and support that I was experiencing when I was coming out to people who knew me before I, you know, was, was out as non-binary. Um, and again, like there's room in the world for a thousand different stories about a thousand different um, non-binary experiences. But for me, I think the most beautiful experience that I had in, you know, coming to the realization that I was non-binary and then, and then coming out as non-binary was all these people around you who love you and wanted to support you and wanted everything that was the best for you. <sighs> Sorry, I'm getting a little <laughs> teary. Um, and they don't want to make a mistake. They want so badly not to hurt your feelings mm -hmm. or do anything to like set you back or, or, or anything like that. And it's just, it was a beautiful thing to experience and also uh, very funny, also very funny to have, you know, these people who are trying really hard to like um, be a good ally or, or be supportive of you, but not knowing what to say and sometimes saying mm -hmm. something that's kind of silly. Um, and I wanted to kind of celebrate that. And the best way I thought mm -hmm. to do that was through Simone's point of view, um, because she's the person that's experiencing this, getting to know a person as, you know, one way. And then, um, you know, being told like, oh, actually my pronouns are they, them. And that's kind of all that's changed. And the sort of like struggle slash love that comes out of uh, somebody who's trying to, you know, support someone um, who says that to them. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I really, I'm really glad that I got to tell the story from her point of view um, because I, I thought it was an important story to tell. Oh, don't That's get serious for a bookshop. It's so beautiful. <laughs> it is so beautiful. And and I love that. Um, yeah, it was really interesting to me uh, reading this book just personally because um, with Ray coming out later in the book, um, but I had you know known from the beginning because I read the synopsis, like you said, that Ray's non-binary. And so I feel like, at least like as a queer non-binary person, I just read them as non-binary like the whole time. Like I feel like my brain kind of just like read over, you know, like blanked over the she pronouns until like, you know, it switched. Um, but it was great seeing that transition in um, Simone's mind. And I, and I think it was very realistic, like you said, that, you know, she doesn't get things perfect and she, you know, messes up a few times and, but she wants to. Um, and I think it's unrealistic. Yeah, that people will magically just get everything right, you know, when a person that they love, you know, changes something like that about themselves in their mind. Um, and yeah, and you, you just, you just like see, even if she like stumbles over the pronoun sometimes, like her affection never changes. And I, I think one of my favorite, it's like a slight spoiler, but one of my other favorite parts of this book is when she takes um the pill bottles and Ray's uh, apartment and switches and and like marks out and writes Ray on them. Oh my god! I I like when I think about this book, I think about that moment. That was just such a sweet and wonderful thing, and I love all of her like subtle ways of showing affection. And she's not very good at showing affection, but she does it in all these wonderful subtle. Yeah, ways. no, that is that that is so a good well. moment. I was very smart to put that in there, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, I just, it, was, I, it just made me happy. Yeah, it, it was just like those little moments of like affirmation that you get to experience once you are out. Um, and when people mm -hmm. like care enough to think about that stuff or even just asking like, you know, oh, should I do this now? Or should I do that now? Or like, how are we, you know, just just even, even like hearing those like questions be asked or having those conversations is like, what a joy, like <laughs> what, a, what a great opportunity and, and privilege to, you know, uh, oh, a story bookshop is going to pop in now. I have been join, join, join. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were welcome and actually, to both, <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just gonna say before because we're gonna transition to some questions and answers. I see some questions down here um, that Laura will ask. But before we do that, I just want to ask one final question from me because I feel like I've been like my favorite part, my favorite part. So I was wondering, TJ, if you have like a favorite part or a favorite scene in this book? <sighs> I mean, I love all my children equally, but <laughs> um, 
I think the scene that probably holds uh, a special place in my heart is the first scene that I wrote because it was the scene that I kind of had the dialogue in mind for before I even like sat down and got a chance to start writing. Um, and it's the scene where, you know, Ray comes out to Simone um, as non-binary at work. And I didn't want it to be, you know, this tragic, you know, like, let's all sit down and, you know, wear our funeral shrouds and, you know, get, get serious or anything. Like, it's just, it's a conversation that is serious, but it's also very charming and funny. And, and you know, Simone is very flustered and trying her best and Ray's having a great time <laughs> because, uh, you know, Simone, it, all, of the, um, all of the onus is, is kind of on Simone and, you know, a, a weight has been lifted off of Ray's shoulders. And that was a very fun and funny scene to write. Um, and I think, you know, it is the turning point in their relationship where Simone is realizing like, oh, like we're not just like work friends. We're like, I'm being trusted with something very important, um, which she takes very seriously. And, and I think that, you know, that's such a pivotal scene and I love it so much. Um, and I hope everyone else does too. We do. It's wonderful. <laughs> we are, yes. take this applause on behalf of everyone in the chat. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, we are gonna go um, into questions. Uh, the current top question is one from Phobos, Flavos. I'm hoping I'm saying one of those, right? If not, you can correct me in the chat. Uh, I will not be offended. <laughs> um, TJ, when you were researching, what were some of your favorite YA and NA or adult, if you can think of any books with non-binary representation? Uh, so I read Cemetery Boys. I think we all read Cemetery Boys, hopefully. If you haven't read Cemetery Boys, it's um, it's about a young trans boy who is Latino and a, um, it, it, it's very supernatural and there's a ghost boyfriend and it's very cute and also very, very um, fun. Uh, so I, I read that um, when it came out. I read uh, Steven Salvatore's um, Can't Take That Away From Me, which has a genderqueer teen lead in it um, and a very uh, sweet and heartwarming um, and heart-wrenching uh, story about, you know, trying to navigate uh, high school as a genderqueer young person. And um, those are the two that are coming to mind and then my brain cell just kind of fizzled out, so. <laughs> Those are two great answers. Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. Anita, do you have any like favorite non-binary reads while we're on the subject? Um, sure. Yeah, I think one of the first um, adult romance books I read with a non-binary lead is called The Love Study by Chris Ripper, um, which is published by Karina Press. Uh, Karina publishes a ton of queer um, and trans stuff if you haven't checked out their catalog. Um, but yeah, and there, um, I know Chris Ripper, Chris Ripper just came out with a new book. I want to read it so bad. Um, but in the love study, it was interesting because they're a non-binary character. Um, like never once, like you never once uh, see mention or a reveal of how, um, you know, they were born at birth, you know, the sex assigned at birth. And so that was really interesting to me. And so that actually was how I originally wrote um, Love and Other Disasters, but then I put in more about London's backstory and to change that a little bit. Um, but anyway, just a really sweet book that also has to do with YouTube channels and uh, stuff like that. Um, so I think if you, yeah, love Chef's Kiss, you'd also love um, The Love Study. Um, and I feel like <laughs> I'm also blanking. I feel like when people like, you know, well, ask me about books, I'm like, I've never read a book in my life. But I will say- um, I've never read a book. <laughs> But so, like, in the span of the last two months, I read um, my friend's book, which isn't out yet. It's currently on sub, so it's being shopped around to editors, um, but it's an amazing trans romance. Uh, it's a baseball romance about, uh, like, the first trans baseball professional player, and it's, it's oh my god, it's so good. I can't wait until it's a book. Um, and then I read your book, TJ, and so it was, like, in a span of a month or two, getting to read these two fantastic trans romances. And it was just like so amazing and affirming. And so I just can't wait until, yeah, there's even more out there. A million, a thousand. We need more, yeah. more, more, please. 
Yeah. To like oh, fill the hole in my heart that I didn't know I had. <laughs> everyone needs to uh, fill up their cart on our site quickly with all these titles because these are great recommendations. <laughs> um, all right. Carter came through with a great question. Um, shout out to Carter. Uh, what were the best things you baked while writing this book? What's the cat's name, first of all? <laughs> this is... <laughs> This is Cleveland. Cleveland, hello. A beautiful cat. Okay. Um, sorry, the question. Things that I baked. <laughs> Best thing you baked during the ride. That distracted all of us. <laughs> I just sorry. completely derailed. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, like I said, I'm kind of a home baker. I don't tend to do things that are super complicated, but while I was writing this book, there were some things where I was like, oh, I'm gonna need to know how to make this because Simone knows how to make it. Um, so the galette, which is I think the first real thing that we see Simone bake to completion. I don't like that phrase. Um, <laughs> the first thing that she we see her bake and eat um, <laughs> is this autumnal galette which I kind of dreamed up in my head as I was writing. And then I was like, I probably should learn what a galette is. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I used good old King Arthur Flowers website to figure out how one would even make a savory galette. And then I played around with it until I figured out how a person in the real world would make that. So that was fun and very cheese laden. So I'd eat that again. Um, other things were not quite as successful, but fun. I learned how to make a lot of chocolate desserts for a trifle, which um, I don't think belongs in the real world. It's just too much. It would kill you to have more than like three bites of it. <laughs> um, I could just hear like Prue Leith in my head going like, ooh, ooh, quite a lot of calories, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know if it's worth it. So, um, but it was fun. It was fun to try something that I would never have normally done in like a home kitchen. Uh, yeah. Those are wonderful. I have never heard of either of those. But... A, gal a galette is like a pie that you didn't try so hard. Mm -hmm. You just kind of yeah. fold it into like a big okay. hot pocket situation. Confession, I pie like is I like could, probably like... last on the list for me in terms of favorite desserts. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Anita, were you saying something? Oh, I was going to say that I felt like I could like taste that galette when you described it in the book. Like all of your food descriptions were just so good. It made me so hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry. I was very hungry. Well, well, I'm hungry right now. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. Oh, this one's from me, if we don't mind. Um, but as a lover, as a lover of like enemies to lovers and like the grumpy and sunshine kind of dynamic, what is it about that that appeals most to you? Like why why that trope? Um, well, I think I think like I said before, I think there's a lot of inherent comedy in, in opposites having to to interact when they're coming from different goals, right? Like Ray's goal is to make friends and influence people and, or not even influence people. Like they don't really care that much about influencing people. They just want to like have fun and make friends. And Simone wants to be at the top of her class and be perfect and get gold stars and, and all of that stuff. And I think um, the best part about Grumpy Sunshine is seeing them kind of do a role reversal at certain points as we watch the characters grow. Um, you know, the the grumpy one gets soft <laughs> for the sunshine one, uh, which is always fun to see. And I personally like seeing the sunshine one get a little, you know, a little bit hardcore, a little bit, um, I don't know, uh, rabid, a little bit feral uh, at certain <laughs> points. I think it's really interesting to see when characters kind of break out of their, you know, their their mold. And um, I think there are a couple of points where we get to see Ray and Simone do that. And I think it's really fun. I love that. Um, Anita, did you, did you want to jump in with anything? Since I know you're also a, a writer of these kind of dynamics. Yeah, I agree. It's just so fun to play with. 
But uh, what I think, sorry, my dog's being annoying. Um, <laughs> but what I think, what I think you do so well, TJ, and yours too, is that like, even though they're so different, they never try to change each other. And so, like, yeah, like you know, yeah, Simone does get like a little soft, and um, like you see, like Ray be a little more serious at points. But they're still like consistently themselves throughout the entire book. And so I think when you write two characters who are very different, it kind of gives that opportunity to explore the idea of like loving other people without reserve and like not because of like, you know, how they compliment you, but just for who they are. Um, and I think that that is like a really powerful message. Um, in addition to just getting to write lots of like funny hijinks when they're so different. <laughs> That was really smart. I should have said something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh no! no. Oh, oh, <laughs> I need Sorry. to come back, say smart Sorry. things. Sorry. I'm calling them off Sorry. screen. <laughs> you were like, and that was me, and I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I froze. And so I needed to, re to unfreeze myself. I was in a very unflattering position. Anyway. Uh, no, but but you're right. I I really dig when you know people who are super opposites or or very different from each other, like come to really enjoy those you know differences in the other person and not try to you know mold them or change them into something that they're not. Like that, I'm not into that. Um, so yeah, I totally get it. Um, okay, I think you might have touched on this earlier. Um, Ali asks. What was your favorite part of the publishing process? Oh, so many. <laughs> no, I mean, like, like we were talking before, publishing is really slow and, you know, anticlimactic sometimes. Um, <laughs> but I think my favorite part of the process was one, working with an amazing editor, Laura Jones at Atria. Um, she understood like right oh, away what I was doing. Laura, she, no. she, what? One of the questions is from Laura Jones. Oh, is this question from Laura Jones? TJ, what yeah, would you no, say is your favorite there. part of the process? <laughs> and be sure to spell my name correctly. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Laura, Laura understood right away what I was trying to write and what I was trying to do and what kind of story I was trying to tell. And she, she wasn't trying to change Ray or Simone to kind of fit some other vision that you know may have may have been uh in in her in her head but um i really appreciated that and that she you know understood where we were going with it um so that was a really fun part going through like developmental edits with laura was um because every comment that she had i was like that's what i should have done <laughs> and then laura's like yeah now you get to do it and i'm like all oh, right <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it was it was fun to to work with an editor who was on such the same wavelength as me. And then I got to give a shout out to the copy editing part of the process, which was a humbling experience. If you have never been professionally copy edited, um, imagine just the smartest people in the world getting paid not nearly a fraction enough of what they are owed in this universe to tell you how bad you are at the thing that you thought you were really good at. <laughs> it's just, it was very funny to me, the things that they caught that I would have just been like, I don't know if someone's sitting or standing, who cares? Well, they care. And like, I definitely <laughs> should start caring. So um, shout out to copy editors, you saved my butt. <laughs> okay, are you ready for a little bit of a, a speed round? Yes. Okay. How important was it to you to write a story that didn't rely heavily on queer trauma? It's something that I encounter a lot reading queer fiction and I just came here for a good time, but I'm reading slurs to get to the romance. Relatable. Very important. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I don't, is this like super lightning or I'll just give a quick answer. The quick answer is that like, we've seen way too many stories about queer trauma, especially trans trauma. Um, and, you know, if there is any non-binary representation in something, um, chances are it involved a, a lot of trauma as well. So those were stories mostly written by and for cis people, and I'm sick of them, and I don't care for them, and I don't want to see them anymore. I want to see fun shit happening for us. I want to see us falling in love and holding up banks and stealing horses and 
uh, sailing ships and doing all that cool shit that other people have gotten to do for the last couple hundred years in publishing. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the classic, you know, holding up banks uh, part of publishing. <laughs> All right. And who is your favorite celebrity chef and did they influence any aspects of Chef's Kiss? My favorite what? Uh, celebrity chef. Ina, Ina, if you're watching, um, <laughs> I'm available any weekend to come out to Long Island if you're if you're available. Um, <laughs> she's my hero. She's the she's the the blueprint. She's who I want to be when I grow up. She's just, you know, I I learned so much watching her show back before I could like afford good cheese or good olive oil. And um, now that I can sometimes afford good cheese and good olive oil, it's just, you know, her whole demeanor about like, you know, everyone just fucking have fun and chill out and come to a party and we'll sit around and we'll, she put Parmesan shards in a bowl and said, this is my party snack that I'm serving to guests. And I say, give this woman a presidency of some kind because like, she knows what's up when no one else knows what's up, she knows. So yeah, she definitely is my favorite celebrity chef. And I do think there's a little bit of her in the celebrity chef in Chef's Kiss that is Simone's hero. Um, I think that Lizette, who is the fictional chef that Simone um, worships is a little bit Ina, a little bit Mary Berry, a little bit um, Julia Child. You know, she's just like a combination of every person on TV that I grew up watching or still watch that um, I just wanted to be or, you know, sit in the, sit in the kitchen with. Yeah. Man, like queer people and Ina Garden and Mary Berry just, <laughs> yeah. we just, we just love them. I don't, I can't explain. I, I mean, I, I know why. It's because we're all just going to sit around and drink cocktails with them and just like bitch. Um, yeah. No, they're um, great. Okay. Thank you so much for all your answers and such a wonderful time. Oh my God, Anita said I'm done. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello again. Um, Thank you so much, both of you, for your time. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming and for watching and supporting. Uh, don't forget to get your signed copy of Chef's Kiss if you haven't already. There is a little green button down there um, where you can get it. And also, while you're on our website, there's this great book uh, called Love and Other Disasters. I don't know. Maybe you can pick that up, too. Couldn't hurt. <laughs> oh, don't before we go, do you want to see the final cheesecake, what it'll look like when it comes out of the oven? Yeah, yeah. sure. Sure. Okay. Really quick. Okay. So there she is. She's lovely. Oh, She's got, I mean, it fell in the taxi, so I'm really sorry. It's not like perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a lovely cheesecake. It's huge. It feeds a family of many and it's got your little pineapple bits and it's just, it's a delight. So please make it if you want to spend a couple hours in the kitchen making a cheesecake. Thank you. Um, yeah, and now you get to go cheese. enjoy it and just eat your cheesecake and enjoy the rest of your night, TJ. I'm so excited. Thank you. I am going to eat <laughs> this entire thing. Yes, I'm going to order it. some. <laughs> all right. Have a good night, everyone. Yes. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Astoria Bookshop. Thank you, Anita, so, so much. Of course. Thank you, everybody. Oh, no. The end broadcast button is failing on me. Okay. We're just here all night. <laughs> just, just a smile and nod.